Hello and welcome to my next playthrough video for the game Codeword Cromwell, The German Invasion of England, June 8th, 1940. Now this is a, an older game. Uh, it's actually newer than where there is Discord, which I have right there waiting for us to play. Um, but I actually got them in this order. I've never played where there is Discord before. I have it. It's one of my unplayed games, so it's on my list. But I wanted to do this one first. I am more familiar with this one, although it's been well over a year since I've played. And uh, this one is, and say hello to my son, who wants some YouTube fame and fortune here. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, this game is a long game. I'm not gonna lie about that. Uh, let's get some of the formalities out of the way. Uh, we're gonna set up in this video. Uh, we're gonna start playing in video two. We'll start playing in video two. So if you just wanna see how it's played, you can skip through this. The setup is mostly straightforward because we can, we can just uh, use the, uh, this little chart here. Uh, there is stuff like this you need to familiar, film, familiarize yourself with. But to be honest, this is a flowchart game, meaning you start at number one, you go to number two, you go to number three, and then it's the end of the round. Um, I want you to get to like step 12 or 15. And that's how we're going to play this game. I don't remember all the rules. So um, even though I've played it before, uh, I don't remember everything. So uh, we're going to refresh ourselves as we play. And... Um, for those of you who know my videos, I'm not trying to make a professional video. I'm inviting you to my table. So to me, there's a big difference. I'm not here to edit my software. I'm not going to buy editing software. Um, uh, you get to see me play and you get to join me at the table and be a part of it. That's all. Nothing more, nothing less. Uh, I'm not asking you for money. I'm not doing any of those things. I'm just simply asking you to play. So uh, maybe somebody else could do a better job. But anyways, I'll stop belaboring that. If you want to see the playthrough, go to video two. Uh, without further ado, let's get this setup going. So let's look at the map real quick. Uh, the map has grids all around it. Oh, what is the objective of this game? I haven't even told you about that. This game is a weird one. It is a military simulation of what would happen if Germany were to attack a quaint little town in London. And this town, I think, might have a name. It might not. I don't remember. Um, but uh, it's a... Uh, there's even, like, this uh, letter at the, at the front that, you know, says, you know, Please find the enclosed, the new training simulation developed by the Directed. If you're aware, following the 1942 syllabus review, it was decided to produce a module based around what would become known as the Battle of Berkham Stokes. There you go. That's the name of the town. The defensive action mounted by British home forces in the opening day of the invasion, June 8th, 1940, at the village of that name in East Sussex. So there's a village named Berkham Stokes in East Sussex. The decision to produce this module was based on the unique nature of the action, a mixture of regular, irregular, and civilian defenders, a well-equipped but widely dispersed attacking force, a fixed defense in rural terrain, all set against a fluid and evolving strategic situation. Whilst it is unlikely that the exact circumstance of those events, nor the campaign of which they were a small but important element, will be repeated, it is felt that this will provide a valuable training tool for officers seeking to learn those infantry combat techniques in a high-intensity, civilian-dense rural environment. Following the destruction of the formal Royal Military College during the Sandhurst Siege and the reconstitution of training facilities in our new location, we are still unable to back up this desktop exercise with a real-time field simulation. However, I am confident that you will find this an interesting and worthy addition to the Combined Forces Officer Training Program. Sincerely, Commandant Warren Stokes. All right, so um, <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, emulating an invasion of Britain. And the map is a giant grid. 
So you could do this on hex paper if you really wanted. It's just that we have beautiful graphics and people complain about the board being way too big. It's taking up a very large portion of my table. Now, mind you, my table has tons of space. I have a very large table. I go just as far the other direction, but you see all my games are piled up on it. And then, of course, I just play in the middle here uh, when I do these videos. But um, this takes up almost as much space, actually as much space as 18OE, which, as you know, is one of my epic, epic games. Um, this game uh, gets a lot of criticism because the, the uh, squares, which is this big, um, they just feel it's way too big. I love it. I understand some people don't have big tables and this is really difficult for them. I, I mean, I do have sympathy for that, but in terms of uh, how awesome it is to have a big board, uh, this part, it just, I, I absolutely love it. Because when we start putting pieces on the board, I don't feel like I have to just constantly, I mean, a lot of games, the, the areas are so small that you're constantly having to manipulate pieces. Not so in this, <laughs> this one, you have plenty of space. But anyways, let's dive in. Um, we'll, we'll do a quick review of what kind of things you're gonna see in the game. So for example, you're gonna have what's called regular units and there's gonna be US units and United Kingdom units. And they're gonna have three numbers on them. The attack factor is five, the close combat is seven, and the movement is six. And uh, we'll get into what all those mean, but basically you're gonna roll dice and I think uh, for attack factor of five, you're going to roll five dice. And it's either you have to roll a ten or you have to roll a one. I can't remember which one it is. But it's a really low odds of hitting. You have to roll like a perfect like a perfect ten or, or a one and uh, on a ten-sided die. And once you accomplish that, I'm sorry, it, they're six-sided dice. So they're not ten-sided dice, they're six-sided dice. But um, I either have to roll sixes or ones. I can't remember which way the game goes. And um, that's the only way you hit is with sixes and ones. So it's um, you know a one in six chance for each die, and then you have five dice. So what's that, a five in six chance, I guess, of getting a one hit? Uh, so that guy has a good attack factor. But anyways, getting back to this, there are home guard units, which you can see have a lot different numbers. And then there's this stripe. So you can see that there's like gold on the top and then there's this like red or maroon on the bottom. Uh, that's the kind of weapons they can use. The gold weapons, are, of course, are the uh, military grade. And here you can see they're the civilians and you'll see that they're all maroon. And here's a civilian that could have maroon or military uh, grade. So it just depends on who you're talking about. And you can see that there's, uh... oh, excuse me. There's a conventional attack factor with a superscript. And we'll get into what that is. In fact, I gotta look up what that is, but it's something to like, you know, he normally has an attack value of zero, but it's a two if something happens. I can't remember what. Um, and then you can see here, the civilians have a very low attack factor. This one only has an attack factor of one, but their close combat's really high. So they're gonna wanna get up close and personal but they're gonna die more easily if they're up close and personal. And, um, and then you have an officer uh, unit that has the rank, otherwise it's basically the same. And then here you can see there's a conditional attack factor that's bracketed. Uh, the other one's superscripted, this one's bracketed. They each have different things. Here you can see what's called a, a villager unit. So uh, this here is the South Sussex Hunt. So it's basically a hunting club. It's the entire club. So it's not an individual person. It represents a, a group of people. And so these group of people are represented by this token. And so you have the hunting club that I guess is fairly decent with a rifle. So therefore their attack factor is better than the average citizen. And then of course there's gonna be German infantry units. And yes, there are even tanks <laughs> that join. Uh, there's gonna be motorcycles we're gonna find. There are going to be heavy machine guns and anti-tank guns that we're going to find. Uh, some of them require two operators because they have the two bars on the top. And then here you can find this is, this is a Lee Enfield rifle and it's got that maroon bar. So that means that um, somebody who can handle maroon weapons uses it. And here you can see it hits on a five or a six. So I'm guessing you have to roll sixes. And this one would hit on a five or a six, which is better odds of hitting. 
Um, so uh, those are all things that you're gonna see as we play this game. And I know I just plowed through it real quick and just read to you basically what it says on this page, but this page is an important one. We will come back to it many, many times. But um, jumping in to setup, um, there are two, this is the setup sheet. And then this one here are all of our charts and tables we need for when we're actually playing. And uh, this is a very good player aid, by the way, uh, for helping us. But for now, we got to get get the game going here. So, so basically, we have to go around the board, and so it's just telling us a, a quick message here that for counters that don't have reverse side content, they actually have the setup location printed on the counter, and uh, that is actually a, a brilliant thing that he did. Um, so I have. Uh, one of these little Plano type boxes and you can see here uh, I have I have the 200 the 20th regiment uh, in one box and so I'm just going to take those out and we're going to just put them on my table for now um, these are German units so they're not going to be coming out anytime soon uh, not until the game play actually starts and the next one we have are the first And then we have the fifth. And lastly is the seventh. I think we're gonna run into the fifth and the seventh the most, um, but um, let's keep going. There's gonna be these control markers. These are for when the Germans control those grids that we were just going over on the city. So, uh, the more of these that are out there, the better, the worse we're doing. Um, this is like a tower defense game, by the way. If you're wondering, what the heck kind of game is this? It's like a tower defense, um, but it's also not like a tower defense. But you'll see that in a second. But there's definitely, um, you know, we lose the game if we lose the church, which is in the middle. So almost like, a, you know, just imagine that's a castle and this is your classic tower defense game. All right, so we have a bunch of items here, and then I have a bunch of items in a bag, and I also have even more I'm gonna pull out of my little box. And I don't like these Plano boxes because it's just really hard to reach them, um, or, you know, to get everything out. So, I also have the dilemma that I don't want to put too much stuff on the game board because then I have to, we're actually going to be setting up the game board and I, I'm going to get confused over whether it's something that's set up or if it's a... Uh... So you're, you're probably noticing there's a lot of pieces and it's because there is, there's no getting around that. Um, it's definitely not as epic as some other games, but um... so anyways, I, I just unloaded my whole Plano box. So uh, real quick, uh, you want to get the German units, just set them to the side. Um, there's going to be times in the game that Germans are going to spawn on the map from these different regiments. And there's four of them, as you can see. Um, keep them separate. You have some things like this British cruiser tank that um, are off board. And so it's really awesome because it tells you it's off board. So this one does not tell you off board, so we got to just deal with that later and we have quite a few of those not surprised and then we have some more items that are off board and i do advise you to actually look at the token and just read what it says before we go through the the chart but um here you can see there's a matilda and then yes these are the german tanks so let's put them over by the germans and these are of course our tanks so we'll put those uh, off to the side as well and uh, these these uh, units here uh, they might start the game uh, they might not um, okay so then we have these two uh, they go over here on this board and we'll take care of that in a second 
And then this is just your compass, north, east, and west. And so it's just saying this is in a northern approach, the western approach, and the eastern approach. And uh, you may be wondering, well, what the heck's that? It's, it's actually written on the board, or at least I thought it was. Hmm. Oh, never mind, never mind. I know what these are. These are spawn points for the Germans. So if they're going to spawn on the north, these are th these indicate. See, look, there's uh, these squares along the. So if they're doing an eastern approach, they can approach from here, there, there, or there. And then what you would do is once you determine where they're approaching, you just put that token there to, to indicate that. Okay, so we won't worry about those in, right now. Okay, so now we got these weapons. So for example, we have this Springfield off board, Mauser off board. A fire is just a condition off board, you know, like a building being on fire. And we got these weapons. I do like to try to sort them a little bit. A Rolls Royce, I, yeah, definitely off board. Um, and then this Norton off board. An anti tank, which is always helpful. So we can get some mines down, but all of these are off board for now. Uh, even this ammo should be off board, and it is. The med kits are off board. Yes. Okay, these that are pictures of people. Now, what's interesting about them is there's a traitor in this game. Somebody in our town is actually working for the Germans. Ooh. And we have to actually catch the traitor. And so a lot of this is uh, indicating for us um, when that traitor there's the southern approach one. Uh, so there's like a mechanic for determining who the traitor is. And then there's a, also a mechanic of uh, whether they're in good standing. And way up there on the top of the board, you can see there's a good standing person of interest. And I think that that's I8B status, which I think means they're the traitor. <laughs> I'm not sure. We'll, we'll, we'll refresh our memory on that. But I know that these go up there. Oh, 18B status. So I'm just going to put them like up off the board there for now. They don't actually go on the game. Now, for every one of those pictures that you saw us put up there, there's an actual token. So these people are real people walking around the town. That is just for uh, the whodunit part of the game. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so you got Betty Tanner here, and see the, the reverse side has an injury side. So when they get injured, they get flipped over and they have worse stats. So the people we're going to have to do the old-fashioned way by looking it up in the book. And uh, But like, for example, this acid is going to start at the schoolhouse. And um, the schoolhouse being, of course, right there. And I can tell you that the teacher starts with them. Betsy, Betty Tanner is the, uh, the bar tender. So let's just, I'm going to put the camera down and I'm just going to sort things out by type and then we'll go from there. So we're going to get the, the citizens, you know, in one pile. We'll get the weapons in another and then sort it out from there. I'm pretty sure all of these units that you saw me have, which are these, are actually off out of the game. Uh, these are American units. They're definitely out. Sometimes you can play a whole game and never have the Americans help. So the Yanks are pretty busy. <clears throat> and I apologize. Like I said, go to video two if this is boring the snot out of you. Um, I happen to think that sometimes there's a benefit to people being able to see the setup and and to be able to see it with you. So uh, again, my apologies if this is too boring. Uh, I promise I will do video two before actual gameplay. Okay, so we're getting close. And I probably could start putting stuff on the board, but I want to continue 
getting everything sorted. All right, so what you're basically gonna have is this is like the home guard. And uh, most of these are the home guard. These that are off map, these are like seasoned military troops. So they're fully trained. This is sort of like, um, I mean, their home, home guard might be the equivalent of our Coast Guard, maybe uh, in the US. Um, so they're partially trained. They're, they're regular citizens that just have a, you know, they're, they're just on local duty. Um, so they're hardly any better than the, a citizen in terms of combat abilities. But uh, that's what these are. And, and we definitely have to look at the rulebook for where those set up and for where the citizens set up. But for the rest, uh, they really are told to us. So, um, for example, oh, these are just like citizens. But I can tell you the teachers are going to go in the schoolhouse. I'm pretty darn sure that's what's going to happen there. So that tile represents a whole group of teachers, and they happen to have access to acid from the chemistry lab. <laughs> so uh, it's pretty funny. Um, I, I think this game has a lot of really cool elements to it. So for example, these are pull sticks, and they're an actual weapon. And they are at the pub. So the pub is right here. And then we have pitchforks, which are at the barn. And the barn might be down here, yes. I think we're covering up the barn. Uh, nope, that's the bridle path. Where is the barn? Mm, Newspaper is here. There is the barn. So this pitchfork needs to go in here and I gotta get all these other pieces out of the way. So the bats are gonna go in the cricket. Yeah, there's a cricket pavilion. And this gammon goes in the West Woods. Oh, this keeps saying South. That's what's screwing me up. West Woods. Okay, the shotgun goes with Reynolds. And Reynolds is just a person who I think is the sheriff. So those two go together. The Webley goes with Captain McGowan, who is the officer. The Lanchester goes with Sergeant Taylor, who is another officer. This one goes in the equipment bag. So that's what's inside of this, uh, this bag that I was showing you. All right, Lee Enfield goes with Sergeant Drake. I think that's actually the, the sheriff. Okay, Blunderbuss, Earl Thorncroft. There you are. And then these bottles go to the pub. The farmhands, of course, go on the farm, I'm pretty sure. So I'm gonna put them with the fitch pitchforks. This mills goes on the main road. Okay, there is an actual square called Main Road somewhere. I'm having a hard time finding it. South Stream Bridge. Main Road, right here. Okay, this Lee Enfield goes on the bridge. And the darts should go on the pub. And we'll crank through now the rest of this. So what it's telling you is that uh, in the shop, you want to put Edith Finley. So Edith Finley is your shopkeeper person. And uh, basically she has a 10 close combat, a zero attack value, and she has three movement points. That's how you read that. Um, and we'll get into what the, what does it mean to have a 10 close combat? Um, I think you need to roll two dice and get a perfect, to get an exact 10 in order for it to matter. So it's very tough. Okay, the garage here is James Arnold. Okay, James Arnold, where are you? Here he is, so here's your, uh, your garage mechanic guy. So he's got the superscript, so we need to look up what the superscript means. I think uh, he normally is a zero, but he gets a two if something happens, so we'll find out. 
Uh, so we got to find the garage, which is actually right here. And next, the bank is Arthur Pendrake. So Arthur is this distinguished gentleman. And so he's in the bank. And next up is the Dr. Greystone is in surgery. So he's your older guy there. And he's at the hospital or medical clinic, I guess, is what... Uh, newspaper is Drayden Fox, and he does look like a newspaper kind of guy, very uneducated, and uh, likes to write politically charged things and fake being able to stand up in a hurricane whenever everybody's walking behind him in the shot. Sorry. <laughs> okay, police station, Sergeant Drake, okay, plus is Lee Enfield. So, Sergeant Drake is this guy, and he starts at the police station with his rifle. So we got that covered. The police station being right up there. Okay, next up is the pub, and Betty Tanner and the pub regulars go there. So Betty Tanner, we identified her already. That's this one, and then the pub regulars. So we have an individual person and we have a whole crowd of people and they all start up here at the pub. Okay, next, the schoolhouse is Miss Feather Lake. So, see in America, people dress like that on their graduation day. So it's sort of like a weird, weird graphic for it being just a typical day. Um, Daisy and the farmhands have the pitchfork so at the old barn, so there's Daisy. And the cricket team goes with the bats. So they go way up there. And then on the cricket pitch is one home guard of your choice with a De Gaulle cocktail. So um, I think that might be why I had a De Gaulle cocktail that said it goes in the equipment container. Because I don't see a De Gaulle cocktail. Oh, there it is, right here. That's a De Gaulle cocktail cricket pitch. There we go. Okay, so this is gonna go with one of these members. Now, I need to study what the numbers mean, so that's a decision that I think is a very critical one. Last time I played, uh, you get to position these home guard around and it's just like right here. It's saying any one home guard of your choice So we have to be very smart about where we put our home guard and you can see on the west woods is the gammon bomb which uh, I know we did that that's this and then there's one with the mills bomb and then there's one with uh, Lee Enfield on the bridge So for example, this is a rifle. So we want somebody who's good at using rifles there now, in the church, needs to be Barnstable, Captain McGowan, plus his Webley, and two remaining home guards. So um, that's also something we have to consider. So these, this is Captain McGowan with his Webley. He's going in the church, and so is the Reverend. And uh, so we have to put two home guards there, and then uh, so two home guards are going to go in the church. And then one, two, three, four are going to go around the map. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There's seven total here. So there's one more spot. Or maybe one of them's not a home guard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're fine, we're fine. So then uh, it says put the turn marker in the turn track start space. So the turn marker is... This one. So it says starts on 600 hours, but it's really just right there. And then this one is going to go on an invasion space one. And so there's this invasion track. Okay, so all 12 of the chaplain markers. And in America, chaplain means a religious person. So it's, 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 a, it's a weird word, but uh, it's the people markers. They go face up, and um, there's four primary defensive markers, uh, and then uh, here you roll for north, east, south, and west. And uh, 
using the red German entry numbers printed on the board, roll 2d6 four times, and after each roll, place one primary defense marker in the resultant square. So, uh, so here's what it's trying to say. So we're gonna grab, for example, the east one here, and we're gonna just roll dice for it. So I rolled a three. So that means it goes here in the three spot. Okay, then the, uh, and so if they're going to evade, invade from the east, we know they're coming there. And so that helps you when you're setting up your defense, because remember, there's a little bit of a tower defense to this game. So now I'm gonna roll a seven, and I didn't declare what it was for, but we'll say it's north. And of course, seven is the most frequently rolled number. And then we're gonna roll for the west. Roll a six. And have that there. And now the south, I rolled a four, which should be this guy right here. So they'll be coming in to meet Daisy. I think they're gonna regret that choice. Okay, so then you have wild cards. So Sergeant Reynolds with, or Reynolds with his shotgun, Thorncroft with his blunderbuss. So we have two guys here that are wild cards. Sergeant Taylor with his Lanchester is an anywhere on the board person. The Women's Institute Shooting Club is also anywhere we want, and South Sussex Hunt is anywhere we want. So uh, I have to figure those out as well. And then it's telling you off board, it gives you a nice list of all the markers. And then this stuff is the stuff that's supposed to be in the bag. So I'm just looking through real quick and making sure I don't have any of those. This, all these items should be in your, in your draw bag or draw cup. Um, Okay, so with that being said, I think we're ready to go. Now, it's showing uh, them like this with the uh, face down, so maybe uh, I need to go do that. It said face up, but maybe face up means this. Okay, anyways. <clears throat> That's setup of the game. Uh, the game will consist of these 16 rounds, and uh, you don't need this anymore. This is just used for setup, so you can get rid of that. There is a, uh, a briefing booklet, which is sort of like, um, it's not a choose your own adventure, but like you'll get events, and then there's actually gonna be flavor text that you read. Um, it's fun the first time you play it, it's not so fun after that. Um, the, uh, so I'm going to put this down and try not to damage things. So a couple of things, uh, our objective, uh, is to, we control the home forces. The German forces are coming. Uh, your final mark will be based on analysis of local and strategic situation at the end of the module, turn 16, or if earlier, if certain conditions are met. So um, so uh, we're gonna be uh, measured for how well we did. So let's do real quick, I wanna see what those skills mean. Then I think we can get started. Oh, there is a, um, there is a limit. So uh, for every square, you can only have one armor in a square. You can only have two points worth of villagers or soldiers in a square. And then home guard and characters are one point. So the village defenders are subject to stacking restrictions. Each square may not contain more than five stacking points. The exception to this rule is the church and where you have seven stacking points. So... It's just saying that a villager counts as two points um, and a regular troop counts as two points, whereas a character or a home guard is only one point. Um, the, uh, the key thing being this is considered a villager, right? The group of people. That's a villager, whereas this is a, uh, that's a character. Okay, I know I'm getting a little bit of, into the rules there, but uh, uh, that is an important thing to know, and I'll probably have to review it again in the next video. Um, 
So we want to get to the combat phase. So, so you identify the unit's attack factor. It's the uppermost number on the right hand of the counter. So Home, Gullen, home Guard Volunteer Ford has an attack value of 2. So let me grab Ford real quick. He has an attack value of 2. And then it says Reynolds has attack value of 3, which is probably true. Uh, Reynolds is right here. Yep. So just to give you perspective. Okay. The weapon factor of the weapon being used. That's the white number on the weapon counter. So Ford right now has no weapon, but Reynolds starts the game with a shotgun. So you add the attack factor to the weapon factor. So I would add 3 plus 2 and get 5. And then remember, regular British units do not use individual weapons. Any weapon whose weapon factor is in brackets is not a ranged weapon. It's close combat. So there's, that answers the bracket question. Add the attack factor to the weapon factor. That gives the number of dice. So here I would get to roll 5 dice. Um... Debriefing the German units involved in battle, they were unprepared for the lower resistance. Da, da, da. Conduct an attack roll with the appropriate number of dice. The result of the attack roll depends on the type of weapon being used. If the weapon contains a black triangle in the upper left-hand corner, each roll of five or six is a hit. And there was a weapon that had a black triangle, and it actually shows a five or a six. So this is what they mean by the black triangle. So, um... If the weapon does not have a black triangle, then you need to roll a six to get a hit. So it is very common to completely miss when you shoot. Uh, each hit resolves in a removal. Now that's the other thing, there's no hit points in this game. Uh, if you hit something, it's dead. Uh, and then the unit goes off board on the KIA side. German armor units are not affected by ranged combat. Um, and then they got a nice example here. Uh, let me get it moved so you can see. There's an example here that uh, Lord Thorncroft is defending the schoolhouse and decides to fire at a group of Germans who are advancing across the bridge. He attacks the Germans with a Lee Enfield. He has a basic attack of three. Lee Enfield has a weapon of one. He rolls four dice and gets two fives and a six. Since uh, Lee Enfield's accurate, it has a black triangle, so he gets three hits because the Lee Enfield is a hit on a five or a six. Um, then three German units are removed. That's a really good roll. Okay, some weapons require specialist training. They have the khaki bar, which is the, the gold or yellow bar we were talking about across the top, and only our uh, home guard and whatnot can use them. The civilians cannot. Um, there are two-person weapons, and let's go ahead and... Get these people back off the thing. There are two-person weapons. There's anti-tank combat, which we'll read whenever we get to an actual tank. And then there are number of attacks. Each character, home guard, or regulant may only conduct one attack per turn, including an attack involving a two-person weapon. Villagers may conduct a separate attack with each individual rain weapon they are carrying. Each weapon may target a different adjacent square. They use the same attack factor for each attack. So the women's shooting club members are armed with a Lee Enfield, a Webley, and a Vickers. They could conduct up to three separate attacks in a single turn. The first result was a three attack dice, you know, etc. So those, uh, those groups can, can have a lot of stuff equipped because they represent many people. And um, then there's non-combatants. And... So they may not engage in ranged combat, close combat, or anti-tank unless indicated. Um, then there's a terrain modifier roll. We'll read that later. Um, then there's close combat. Yeah, the close combat is another thing we need to be mindful of. They're only conducted by units that did not engage in ranged combat. They are made against German infantry unit in any adjacent squares, but resolved with a single roll of 2d6. 
So um, to conduct close combat, you find the, the close combat factor and the weapon they're carrying is the second number on the right hand side. So close combat factor, for example, for this guy is nine. Um, close combat weapons have their close combat factor in brackets on their counter. Example, acid has a close combat factor of seven, pitchfork six. So um, I guess this is what they mean by brackets. Those are parentheses in my book. But uh, so anyways, they're, they're in parentheses there. Of a, So then you do, uh, you resolve them one square at a time with all eligible units. Make a single roll of 2d6. If the roll matches the close combat factor of the attacking units, or the weapon. So basically, you by having a weapon, you get a second number you can match. Uh, you're rolling two dice, so it's basically, it's almost like a 1d12, but I know it's not exactly the same. Uh, but, you, but it's really hard to get two out of 12 numbers to match. Um, and then, of course, you kill German infantry for each match. Uh, the hits can be allocated amongst any infantry units, blah, blah, blah. Uh... And then the Germans roll 1d6, and if they get a 6, uh, one British unit takes a hit. And, uh, and we'll, we'll get into that later. But that's, that's basically combat in a nutshell. So some of them, uh, in my opinion, if you're rolling a 2d6, you want a 7 for close combat, right? Because that's going to give you craps numbers, right? The best possible odds of having a roll go in your favor is to have a 7 as one of your numbers. So... Um, so those are the ones that are really good at close combat. A 9 or a 10 is not going to be as good. Now, there are um, things that I also picked up on. Um, oh, where is it? Units can only carry certain things. There's like a carry limit. It's in here somewhere, and I just need to find it. And maybe I can do that in between videos, and when I start video two, I can get into it. So you got moving British units, you got moving equipment and, and equipment limits. Here we go. Uh, characters in Home Guard can only carry one piece of equipment. Villagers can carry three. And the British and U.S. regular units do not carry equipment because their numbers are just darn good. Um, in addition, you can also have a medical kit carried by anybody on top of that. So basically, medical kits don't count. Um, so it was right above our stacking limit. And then um, you do have to roll 1d6 and compare it to their movement value of the bottom right. If the number thrown is less than the movement value, you may move up to the number of scares in, squares indicated by the die. If it's greater than the movement value, you may not move this turn. <laughs> so uh, some of those people that had like a move value of three are really difficult to move. So uh, that's something you have to be mindful of. Um, a movement value of six, of course, is nice because you're basically going to get to move anytime you want. Um, so uh, there are other rules I don't want to, I think we're going to encounter them as we play, and I don't want to just go, okay, let's go look at subparagraph 12D. I, I don't want to do that with you guys. So um, I know I've already taken up 43 minutes, and I think it's time to let's just play. Uh, we're probably going to lose because I uh, didn't do a playthrough before I started recording. And if I remember, this game is actually fairly hard, um, largely because there's just a lot of luck to the game. Uh, some people aren't going to like how much luck there is in this game, and uh, um, that's fine. They don't have to play it. Uh, but anyways, this is a very interesting game. It's probably one of the most unique games I own, and uh, I don't think I have anything that's quite like it. So I wanted to share this with the world, and last I checked, there was still no video for this game. So uh, two reasons to do it. Anyways, thank you all very much. Oh, uh, we got to get our setup finished. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm getting ready to sign off. And Okay, so now that we know what we know, we got to place our stuff. 
So uh, the thing that we've got to be most mindful of is that where are they going to spawn from, right? And um, the other thing that's weird is, for example, you can shoot from one square to the next. You don't actually move into the square with them to shoot. You can shoot from here to there. And even close combat works that way too. So um, it's very wonky that way, but it, it makes sense. Okay, so um, so we have two home guards that need to go into the church. And my logic there is we're gonna pick uh, the two worst ones. And then of course we have a cricket pitch uh, is gonna get this. So let me just put this there in the cricket pitch. So whoever's in the cricket pitch is gonna get basically a uh, Molotov cocktail. And then it looks like there's some grenades for these two. And then over there is a rifle. So, um, I'm going to get the home guard out and put them here. What are the two worst home guards? I would say I see a couple of them there with a one. So this guy has a one, ten, and four, which means it's really hard to even move him, right? Because you got to roll a die and get less than four in order to be able to move him. So he's going in the church because he's not going to be a very mobile guy. So we got one of the two in the church pretty easy peasy. And then these guys all have the same move value. He has the most. He has the best shooting value. Um, he's all around a badass. So we're going to give him the Lee Enfield and put him here on the bridge with the Lee Enfield. And now we need, all of these are the same. So they're all 195s, so I don't think it matters. So we're going to just go and do one there, one there, and one there. And we're, oh. The last one goes in the cricket pitch up there. Okay, so the home guards are all in their place. Uh, some of them don't even have a rifle. Okay, so now we got Earl Thorncroft who has this blunderbuss. Um, the three and the two means he rolls five dice, but he has to get a six to hit. So he's not the best in the world, but what I think I wanna do with him is I'm going to I'm going to put him so uh, if you remember uh, these count as one for stacking limits right um, but if I put him with the home guard so he's basically going to help us protect the east side and then we have we have a uh, Taylor here <coughs> who has an awesome rifle and I think we need to have him help us in the north side so I would put him maybe right here cuz remember they're going to spawn up there and you can shoot one space away and then we have our last guy with the shotgun and I think we should put him here so he can help with that and in case it spawns in the other directions. I mean, it might be awful starting spots. And this is where playing a game uh, once, you can learn some lessons. And I don't know if I have good lessons or not. Now I have to also put this, the hunting club and the women's institute somewhere. And the thing is, is that uh, they only have a two attack value, which means they're only gonna roll two dice. We, they can carry three weapons each. So we want them to have weapons, but they don't have any. There's none on the board. There's none to give them. So um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put them in the church for now and see if we can find some weapons for them later. And in fact, we want weapons for other people too. Uh, but that's where they're going to be for now. Okay. So I think... Yes, we'll start there. And uh, thanks for watching. Stay awesome. And I'll see you at video two.